Hi, thanks for being with us. For many of us, this is an in-between time. We're sort of on the way from where we were to where we're going. For some among us, there's a feeling that on St. Patrick's Day, everything stopped. As COVID came in, the in-between time slowed way down. I'm Catherine. Reverend Dr. Catherine Faith McLean, part of St. Paul's United Church here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Thanks for being with us today. I hope this time of worship will lift your spirits and give you a sense of being more in the present, looking toward the past, looking forward to the future, able to enjoy being in the present. For many, in between times are the time perhaps between health and illness, perhaps between health and recovery, perhaps that in-between time of waiting during, during grief. For some of us, the in-between time is that time of living in grief and yearning toward contentment. For all of us in a life of faith, we live between the promise and the fulfillment. That's the the, the wilderness wandering, we have the promise. We await for and work for the fulfillment. And so today, today we are acknowledging that we are on the way, that we are in between, that we have the promise, but not yet, <laughs> not yet God's fulfillment. That is the topology of the life of faith, that wilderness journey is true of us, it's, it's also a state of mind. So, to reflect all of that, to make it poignant, this service is out of doors. It's on the way. It's going up and going down, going betwixt and between. Save for the music. The music is in the church, grounded in our spiritual home. So, for you, on the way, in between, in a wilderness perhaps. May God bless you. May this worship console you and challenge you and strengthen you and bring you the reassurance that you are indeed a beloved child of God. Welcome to worship. Today we're on the funicular. Today we're traveling in a different mode from the river to the river bank. Welcome. The doors close and we see what we have left behind. Oh, it's beautiful. The river valley, the solid fence that keeps us safe, the trees with a little bit of yellow still.
There's the new bridge again, down river. The sound of the traffic behind and underneath us. And here a moment for prayer. The river running steadily reminds us, Holy One, that our prayers always move onto the steadiness, the steadiness of your grace, and in the steadiness, the steadiness of your spirit. We acknowledge the sweetness of the water that sustains us, the rivers that run across our continent, through our city, bringing moisture and nutrition in the water, the movement, and here the bridges. And we remember, Holy One, that we cross waters that you are with us, always a steady presence. When we are called to traverse in hard times or ordinary daily times, we think of the water that Moses brought from the rock with his staff, his staff that had been a snake in front of Pharaoh, turned into a staff again to bring water from the rock. We remember the water that Miriam brought, that everywhere the prophet Miriam went, when the people camped for the night, there was water, there was a well, Miriam's well, and Holy One, we are grateful. That you quench our thirst In our loneliness, you are with us, quenching that thirst. In our hesitations, you are with us, quenching that ter- thirst. You are with us when we thirst for justice and forgiveness. You are with us when we thirst for righteousness, for neighbor and friend, for nation and peoples. And we seek the day when those thirsts will be quenched and all will have more than enough and your love will abundantly flow unfettered, unrestricted. Amen. Like a gentle rain on a
Now we're at the foot of the funicular. So much traffic, people going here and there. Bridges and roads. Over there, the look-off to the promontory. We'll go there shortly, but for the moment, perhaps you can see the little bit of glistening green, the North Saskatchewan River. Jennifer McCurcher wrote, is reading to us from Exodus. Let's listen to this reading about water from the rock. A reading from Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Water from the rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They were camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Well, God sure did that, right? <laughs> My word. There they were, quarrelsome. On the way, they had been in the wilderness for a while now, and they were complaining to Moses. In fact, they weren't just complaining or being quarrelsome. What they said was, why did you bring us out here? Did you want to kill us along with? our children and our livestock? Moses named the place Masa and Meribah, which mean testing place and quarrelsome, because the people were so quarrelsome and they tested God. When we count through this story in the wilderness, the people quarrel with God, quarrel with Moses about things, which Moses then takes to God ten times. Ten times they put God to the test and say, what is going on here? It would have been better back in Egypt. All of which, of course, was false memory. 
vague untruth, well, and outright lies. They had been slaves in Egypt. Going back was not going to be going back to a place of plenty, of abundance, of living full and happy lives. So, the question, did you bring us out here to kill us with thirst? Is the question they posed to Moses and Moses had already split the sea to save them. Moses had actually turned salt water to sweet. We'll hear a bit about that in another moment already to save them. Moses had been the one who went to God and God provided manna and quails, bread from heaven in the morning and protein in the evening. And now they're complaining about being thirsty. Well, you know, that's not an unreasonable complaint, but all the same, that's where the story is. And so in some ways, by, by being demanding, they, they put God in the role of servant. This is what we need you. You go and get it. And um, at that point, when it starts to be putting God in the role of servant, Moses realizes that his life could be in danger. These people are pretty serious about their complaint. And so he goes off, he leaves off disputing with the people and he goes off to find God and have a conversation and find out what to do. And God, rather than saying, Moses, here's how you deal with these people, God solves the problem. God says, listen, there'll be water. God says, take your rod, the one that you use to part the sea. And you might remember back in Egypt, that's the one that had turned into a snake when Moses put it down on the ground in front of Pharaoh. Pretty powerful thing, this staff. So God tells Moses to go and, and, and use that on, on a stone. Take the staff that you use to strike the Nile and go. I'll be present. That's the thing. I'll be present. And so Moses strikes the stone, the rock, with his staff and, and there's water. Miraculously, there is water, and the thirst is quenched. It's a wonderful story about being saved. It's a wonderful story about God in the wilderness saving the people from thirst. It's also God's creative activity in the midst of chaos. Into this chaotic world, where people are thirsting, God brings water. Water, the, the very basic thing in creation, the very first thing in those ancient stories of God creating the world. And so there's a link here between social order and saving the people, solving the problem and the water, which is the means, of course, of quenching the thirst. So water and social order are linked. It's more than a story. It's a great story, but it's more than a story. It's a symbol to us about God being present with the very creative gifts that are archetypal for us to sustain the community in hard times. It's an act of recreation within creation. It's a story of hope. It's a story of the very presence of God, the very presence of God in the midst of our thirst our thirst for righteousness, our thirst for justice, our thirst for friendship, our thirst for company, our thirst for forgiveness, our thirst for love, our thirst for joy, our thirst for wonder. God is present in this. And out of that big old rock, gushes the crystal fountain like a river, <laughs> I suppose, 
so poignant, like a river of tears. Edmonton Grads Park, I want to show you something. Diane Kuzik's sister was an Edmonton grad. Diane Kuzik is a member of our congregation who lives at St. Joseph's Auxiliary Hospital. The Edmonton grads were legendary basketball players, they were. They compiled the greatest team record in sports history in their 25 years, from 1915 to 1940, they won 502 of 522 games in Canada, the US, and Europe. That means a 96.2% record. That's where we are, Edmonton Grads Park. This enormous rock against which I'm leading, leaning is a memorial rock to the Edmonton Grads huge it's not going anywhere sometimes the stories of women get scattered um, frequently the stories of women get scattered the Edmonton grads were stellar Miriam Miriam was stellar. We get through the story of Exodus with her brother Moses, scattered fragments of her story. And there are connections between Miriam and water that are really important, and they're important when we consider the water from the rock. Um, Miriam stood, of course, beside the waters of the Nile and watched that her baby brother, Moses, would be safe. When the sea was split and the people walked through, it was Miriam who led the dance and who sang the song, the oldest piece of scripture connected with this whole Exodus story is the song that Miriam sang. And she was so grateful, Miriam was so grateful for a miracle that occurred through water that God rewarded Miriam with water. And the tradition is that Miriam connected with water was the source of a well. Wherever the people went through this 40 years, it turns out, wandering through the wilderness, there would be a well as long as Miriam was there. She sings as the river is split, as the Reed Sea is split, as the Red Sea is split, as the people walk through and are dry on the other side. She sings. And the very first thing that happens after she sings and invites the women to dance is that the people start to complain. They need water and the water is salt. And Moses takes that staff that we were talking about a moment ago and throws it into the sea and the water becomes sweet. Miriam sings, the water is changed from salt to sweet. She's present. She's present to it. You know, Miriam, the, her name, uh, the, the meaning of her name is, is uncertain. If it was an Egyptian name, Miriam, 
And you know, Miriam is the basis of Mary and Marianne and all these names of all these wonderful women we know, right? Miriam, the name, if it was Egyptian, means something like beloved. It, it, the root, M-E-R, is the root for, for love, which is quite wonderful. Her name, Miriam, which is also the source for Mary and Marianne and all the Marians, it could also be connected to the sea, to the water. It could be the sea of bitterness, the sea of sorrow. It could be about rebellion. That's pretty cool. Her name also may mean Lady of the Sea, which is very dignified, don't you think? And so Miriam is associated with water. The, the interesting thing about what happens in these stories is that there are several writers. These old stories have several writers, maybe in your family stories or the stories that you tell with your friends. You tell them in different kinds of ways. You all have the, the angle on it. You all have love or joy or maybe anger at the root of the story that you're telling, but you tell it perhaps differently than someone else in your family or your friend group. And that's true about scripture. And in these stories of Exodus, there are several different voices, different writers. And part of what happens is that at least one of the voices take some of the stuff that Miriam did and gives it over to Moses, take some of the stuff done by the woman, the sister, the woman prophet, and gives it to Moses, the man, the leader who is taking them through. And so the stories of the women get forgotten, left out. We are worried, those of us who are watching justice in the U.S. because of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and who will be there to be appointed to replace her. We acknowledge that this very week, Helen Reddy died at 78. I am woman, hear me roar, in numbers too great to ignore as I stretch my loving arms across the land. It behooves us to remember the tellers of the stories. It behooves us to look for the people who perhaps are not the apparent leaders or the big names in the stories. It behooves us to consider the Edmonton grads and this big honking rock, it's not going anywhere. It behooves us to remember that Miriam was the source of water, the well, wherever the people went, when Miriam was with them, God provided water. The prophet Miriam was the source of the well, Miriam's well. Was Moses and his staff that brought forth the crystal fountain. It's Miriam, the source of the well, who's also there in this story. So one more thing, these stories matter. The different people we're telling the stories about matter because astonishing as it could be that a group of slaves escaped the king of Egypt, that's not the only part of the story. What's astonishing and actually puts the fear of God into everybody isn't that that group of slaves in antiquity escaped, but that the escape is part of the worldwide purposes of a creator God, that the escape of the slaves across the river, Miriam dances, the water turns sweet, there is manna, there is quail in the evening, there is a rock from which water comes, there is Miriam and her well, Moses her brother, Aaron her other brother, the three of them lead them. What is, <laughs> what shakes power in its boots? is the worldwide purposes of a creator God who is about the business of setting the chaotic, oppressive world on a better course. Melting away the perpetrators of injustice. That the worldwide purposes of this creator God are shaking out injustice and oppression and replacing it with women who dance, abundance of food, quenching thirst, 
bringing freedom for all, not just for some, but for all. Like a pillar of cloud, you promise to guide us. across the water as we see the top of the mutart the glass against the grass we think of stories stories of people and places and we remember that sometimes stories are squelched or stomped upon or taken to belong to those whose stories they are not. And we ask your forgiveness for times when we have appropriated another's story, times when we have not listened to the story being told. And we ask for your grace and your patience that as we tell our stories, we may find those who will listen. We may shape our words and our phrases with accuracy and honesty. And that we may seek the presence of your spirit. For in your spirit, we live and move and have our being. And with your spirit, we find threads of grace weavings of peace in the very presence of love. Amen. Kingdom the 
turn. Worship time is over, we return, but things are not the same. Not the same because our hearts have been lifted in joy. Not the same because our words have been lifted in song. Sung for us by Susan and Tyson. Our words have been lifted in prayer. Prayed by me and by you in the quiet of your hearts. And so we return to where the river moves swiftly, to where the colors of the season turn overnight, to where the streets and roads welcome us back to the work to which we are called, to the day, to this world, God's loving world, go in the peace of Christ. Amen.